had to be actually at my second CNSD meeting. Well, the first time it was an NCNSD meeting. <coughs> okay, and um, I should also add uh, a note of advertisement for this program next year. Um, just because it's over here and it is an advertisement, this is meant for people who would like to come together to work on problems together. So this is, you know, think of it as a long workshop extending over two months, including a school and so on and so forth. Um, what I'd like to speak about today is a problem problem that is almost 100 years old. Uh, this is the problem of 1 over F noise. Around about 1925, uh, people observed, uh, or it was observed, it wasn't too many instances of that, that if you had an electric uh, device that was just operating, it emitted a signal which when you took the Fourier transform and the, and the, uh, the frequency uh, distribution, the frequency distribution was inversely proportional, the power was inversely proportional to the frequency. Why this happened was a bit of a mystery and it remains in a large sense a mystery even today. Because the signal is not flat, it's not white noise, as you can, you know, when you hear the radio just uh, operating at all frequencies, you get flat noise. It's not correlated noise, but it has uh, a 1 over F dependence. <clears throat> Pretty soon, people started doing numbers of experiments on various different quantities and found that 1 over F noise came about in a variety of situations. You take the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, you Fourier transform it and you look at its frequency distribution, 1 over F. You go to the stock market and you look at your favorite stocks, its fluctuations, 1 over F. Uh, more interestingly, the River Nile has floods. Look at the distribution of the uh, so the spacing between the floods converted into a time series. Now, the Nile civilization is many hundred years old, uh, many thousand years old. They have records, and you fully transform one over there. Pretty soon, it became known as the ubiquitous one over F noise. Namely, that no matter where you look, you find one over F noise. Uh, Wentian Lee, who is a computational biologist at uh, the New York, somewhere in New York, Rockefeller he used to be, he maintains a web page uh, on 1 over F noise, and I'm just going to show you the entries on that before I acknowledge that this work is, what I'm going to talk about today is work done with Aminash Yadav, a PhD student of mine, who is presently at the Central University of Jammu and Deepak Dhar, a long-standing collaborator of mine, who is presently at ISER Pune. Okay, so this is from Ventian's, uh, uh, Ventian's web page, uh, where, you know, you take one of the red noise, it's sometimes called flicker noise. Um, you find it in solar flares, you find it in star twinkles, you find it, like I said, everywhere. And it, the signals typically tend to look uh, like you see them over here. Uh, and what I was telling you is that S of F varies as 1 over F. More correctly, it varies as 1 over F to the power alpha, where the power alpha is somewhere between 1 and 2. Less than 2 and more than 1 is generally uh, all to be considered as 1 over F. And these are the uh, instances. So in electronic devices, which is where it all started in some sense, 174 entries. Uh, in heartbeats, 21 entries. In cognition, 15 entries. Music and speech, uh, 12 entries. Astronomy, uh, 13 entries. Chemical systems, 7. Traffic flow, 9. 
Um, the one that I like is a work related tardiness. <laughs> I mean, there is an entry in that as well. And the point is, it's there everywhere, and one would like to understand why this happens. And uh, just to give you an example of what people mean by one over there, uh, here is the uh, potential energy of a single molecule of beryllium fluoride in liquid beryllium fluoride. Um, now, if you take that potential energy and you look at the signal, it looks like this. Now, the, I mean, looking like this is going to be important, so I need you to pay some attention to the visual impact of the signal. Uh, take the one over there, take the Fourier transform and square it to get the power, uh, this, you know, the power spectrum. And this basically is your one over there. There is a particular frequency. That particular frequency might correspond to something which is well known. It is the overall background which is 1 over f that we are worried about. Why is there a background at all? Okay. Uh, here's another example uh, for uh, dislocation dynamics. It's out of an experiment. Uh, so, uh, Lawson and Alava, they looked at a model of uh, dislocation dynamics and there are experiments of that as well. Uh, and they looked at this particular signal and it, it has a certain structure. Uh, and of course, there again, you have an experiment with this, which is 1 over f. And of course, it's not exactly 1 over f, it's 1 over f to the 1.5, yeah. This is a somewhat basic question on the previous uh, slide you had a Fourier transform. Uh, in which variable have you taken the transform? Is it p? Yeah, I mean, here's a, here's a time series. Okay. Okay. You square first n squared. Transform squared. Transform squared. Transform squared. Transform squared. Transform squared. Transform squared. So it is the power square. Yeah. Right, so you have this over here. Right. Again, one over one over f. And you can see that the exponent is not exactly one. It's anywhere from one, somewhere between one and two. Uh, I could go on. There are many, many examples that one has, as you saw. Uh, in the uh, Wen Jian Li web page. And there are two limits that I would like to draw your attention to. The first is the coin toss experiment. So you take a coin and keep tossing it and you get a time series which is plus or minus one. And that is, uh, that is this signal over here. All right, so you just get complete random noise and that has a flat spectrum. Okay, so if you took the Fourier transform of random sequences of, uh, of 0 and 1 or plus 1, minus 1, so that you have a, a flat spectrum actually, uh, you should get, uh, sorry, uh, that you have a zero average, you should get a spectrum that looks like so. The other random signal that we are all familiar with, and I've looked at not only the talk titles, and you will go on to some of the talks, so I know that this community is familiar with uh, the, the language, uh, the random walk. So you take a two-dimensional, take a random walk in one dimension, on two dimensions, whichever you like, and you know, so here are the steps along to the uh, top, and then down, and up, and down, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the position, and you Fourier transform that, that is your standard Brownian motion. And the standard Brownian motion, well known to have a power spectrum, which is 1 over f squared, all right? So that is the brown line over here. So the random walk has power 1 over f squared. White noise has power f to the 0. It's just flat. And pink noise, flicker noise, 1 over f, is, is a signal that looks like this. And this, it's got the slope 1. OK, so. Basically, one wants to know why do so many signals that occur all over nature, why do they have a spectrum which is one over, which is not a random phenomenon known to be of the Brownian motion type or the uncorrelated white noise type, why do they have correlations? Right. So, this is both to do with dynamics and statistics, so uh, it's, it's a question of interest. And 
as of now, including after I've given a title <laughs> which says explanation, uh, there's a reason why I gave the particular title. Uh, <clears throat> there is really no universal explanation. And given the range of systems that we're looking at, you know, Bach's music, tides in the Nile, and stock market fluctuations or chaotic systems, which I know many of you would have studied. Uh, one may, it, it may be too much to expect to have a universal explanation, but hold on till the end of the talk. However, the, the ubiquity of 1 over F noise in diverse systems suggests that there must be some simple explanation of why this is so rather than having very particular examples of why it must be so in case after case after case. So it would be nice to look for something which is general and independent of the details of the specific system. Now since the 30s there have been explanations one after the other and there are many of them and I know that many of you are familiar with them. Um, one of the most, sort of in a sense, powerful ones um, goes as, um, well, this is the one that I like best, the, that the output signal is seen as a product of, as the product and not the sum, as a product of independent random occurrences. Right? When you have this uh, product of independent random variables rather than the sum, then, as was shown first by Montrol and others, uh, Montrol and uh, I guess who, uh, Schottky maybe, uh, who looked at this problem, the product of a whole set of random variables gives you a distribution which is log normal, and a log normal distribution in a sufficient frame of observance looks like one over there. It looks like an inverse power law. You can also look at a 1 over f spectrum as a superposition of uh, many independent pulse-like events with a power law distribution for the interpulse, uh, these relaxation times. <laughs> Effectively, what you get in the spectrum is a superposition of Lorentzians. If you go for a superposition of Lorentzians, then it turns out that in a sufficient frame, if you've got the right distribution, you should be able to see 1 over f. We've seen, and there have been many papers that have been written, by, including people like Prokachia, Barkai, and others, uh, about chaotic dynamical systems with small number of degrees of freedom, especially near the intermittency. So when you have these long, sticky orbits that keep very, very close, and we had a talk earlier today, you immediately come up with power laws because there are long-lived long correlations in the variables. If you have, power, if you have these long-lived correlations in the variables, it eventually becomes, in the, in the Fourier transform, it will uh, translate into power laws in the Fourier transform. And sometimes they do have exponents which are between 1 and 2. Uh, so, and there are more. Um, particular experiments lead to a particular type of partial differential equation, sometimes with a fractional exponent, and that gives rise to 1 over f. I see this as a sort of very particular case. And of course, there is self-organized criticality or SOC, and again, we heard a couple of talks today. The the title of the first paper that announced SOC was this, Self-Organized Criticality, an Explanation of the 1 over F noise. And that's really the reason why tongue-in-cheek has said the explanation uh, of, of the noise. Uh, now, this has been, as you all know, an immensely influential paper. It's, uh, you know, it's current, you know, in trying to find this to cut and paste onto the slide, I had to go to uh, the uh, the uh, prola to the uh, online uh, archive, and I think it currently stands at over 3,000 citations, which is which is good enough. 
that the, the point is that all these explanations remove, uh, you know, remove the inquiry from um, from one domain to the other. You know, why is it not general? All right. So if you have power law distribution for interparts intervals, so instead of looking for why you're getting the power law, you're asking why you're getting power law for the interparts intervals. If you look at uh, you know, the product of independent or uh, weak independent random variables, what are these weak, you know, what are these things that there are products of? And if it's all due to chaos, you have to find the chaos in the particular occurrence and you may not find it. And again, you know, this, this is particular and so what I'm trying to say is that none of these are truly general. SOC, uh, in fact, in the first paper or first two papers of Bartan and Wiesenfeld, uh, in this, the original sand file model, uh, you know, you could look at the number of, uh, you know, of top rings or activity as a function of time. So again, here is a, a signal versus time. And uh, let me just put those uh, equations up for you. Uh, if this is a cellular automaton model where each site can have either 0, 1, 2, or 3 uh, units of sand on the site. If there are 4 units, then all of them, all the 4 units fall away, and they fall on to the nearest neighbors, and that's what these equations try to describe. And when they fall, they can make others fall, and the others, and so on and so forth, giving rise to avalanches. When you have avalanches, these avalanches can look big like so or small like so. In fact, if you take the system and you find many, many avalanches, they have power law distributions. But if you look at the activity as a function of time, the signal looks like this. And you, know, you can notice there is a sort of vague similarity with the other signals I've been showing you. And, and Bartang and Wiesenfeld tried to suggest that this was really 1 over F noise. Turns out that their arguments weren't quite correct. And if A is less than 1, and this is described in one of the papers that I'll give you a reference to, you finally get an output signal that has a spectrum uh, of alpha equals 3 by 2 plus A for A between uh, uh, 1 and 2. Correct? So you start with, uh, so regardless of what, you know, you start with a Brownian signal which alpha prime is 2, and you finally get uh, your alpha as 3 by 2 plus A, where this A is just the exponent of the nonlinear transform. Right? In particular, if A is equal to 0, you'll get 1.5. And if A is a small number, you'll get anything ranging from 1.5 all the way up to 2. Right. You can do the experiment and you can and see it. So as you change A from 0 to a half, you'll find that the slope of these lines actually goes from half to 2. Okay. So you can tune you know, so you take your input Brownian motion and you get your output is a 1 over F spectrum. Here the exponents are all uh, 1.5 up to uh, well, up to 2. Yeah? So this is, uh, you know, this is described in a Europhysics letters that we, uh, or what eventually became a Europhysics letters paper. Uh, but Anyway, so this is one made, one result that we will have. Uh, basically, you take a, take one signal and convert it into another through this nonlinear response. All right. So schematically, what you're doing is the following: here is your initial signal, here is your nonlinear response, here is your output signal. Okay. I'm sorry, this is going to get a little repetitive. Although I will show you one more result in this particular. Like what? R and Zite you are adding. See, Zite is fed into R and you get the output is eta. Think of, if you think of this as a photodiode, 
you get your, you know, you get some signal that's coming, and output is some kind. Correct. So the signal over here is not identical to the signal over here, but it is related, and the response is instantaneous. It's not keeping any particular memory. I can I can do it with any R. I mean, if I could only do it with that R, it would be sort of pretty weak. Right? I mean, I've, actually, I've already shown you two R, uh, but I'm going to show more. Right? But they're all of a certain type. Right? The reason for that is that many of these response functions have to take input over a huge range and give you an output which is in a finite range. So they all tend really to be sigmoid. So if you can do it with a Brownian spectrum, you can actually do it with a Gaussian spectrum. And uh, so you take your input signal, the input signal is psi, right? Take your input psi to be a discrete time Gaussian stochastic process. All right, and this can have a uh, I require it to have this power spectral density A over F to the alpha. <coughs> okay, and, and A is 1. Uh, and this has got a cutoff of 1 over T for technical reasons which I don't want to elaborate over here. And below this cutoff, the spectrum is 0. So it's just a flat spectrum below 0, below 1 over T and uh, and, and uh, 1 over f to the alpha. And I will take r to be of this type. It can be, you know, it can be time hyperbolic, almost. I think it can be time hyperbolic, but it can be any kind of sigmoidal function. Right? And now I can let b go all the way from 0 to 1. So here are two, here's one signal for different values of alpha and b and you know, you can take signals and play around with them. Okay. So the result which is described in the paper, which is currently uh, somewhere in the uh, space of memory, um, it says the following. The transform function eta has a power spectrum which is b times 1 over f to the power alpha prime, 1 over t to the power beta prime, where alpha prime and beta prime are calculable. Okay, exactly calculable. So, given your alpha, given your b, you can figure out what is beta prime and you can get out what is alpha. Right. So, you take your signal, you have some integrator which is I, I don't think of the integrator as something that one is putting in. You know, your experiment itself is doing that. Uh, <clears throat> all right, and the whole thing can be done analytically. Uh, so, for example, uh, here is the, here is the idea of the cutoff. So you have a flat spectrum uh, below a particular cutoff, and then you do the transform, and you find that your transform exponents exactly match what you would get, all right? And I mean, I can just fill the space with many examples. Uh, you know, here is simulation for v equals 1, simulation for v equals 0. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is that there's actually this pre-factor of, a, you know, 1 over t to the power of beta prime, which is necessary. Namely, in an experiment, you do have a frequency cutoff because you don't you don't look at your signal for infinite time. So your time window tells you what your power is going to be like. Right? And uh, actually, uh, you know, these, this curvature up can be fitted exactly by that particular function. All right? Like I said, the exponents match theory for whether you take alpha equals 1.5 or 2 or what have you. I mean, it's, and as you can see, these lines are actually pretty good, meaning that the theory of the experiment matched out of it. Like I said, it doesn't have to be this sigmoidal function. It doesn't have to be a function that looks like that. 
if I take a signal and separate it into 32 units, that is, I take a signal and I stratify it into 32 levels, and replace each point by the number of ones or zeros in the binary representation of a number. Take any signal, scale it up from 0 to 31, and discretize it. Replace that signal by the number of zeros, or in this particular case, the number of ones in the binary representation of this discretized function. That also will give you the same transform. Using this R. Okay? Because we don't know exactly what is the kind of R that is there. In, you know, I mean, if this, is, uh, this is my transfer function. Here's my voice and it is outputting something. I don't know what the R is over here. But the point is that even very general transfer functions like this will do the same trick. That is, it will take one input uh, frequent, uh, you know, one input power spectrum and give you an output power spectrum. The cases that I considered were the ones where you can do the calculation exactly. So that is not easy because you're looking at uh, just the power spectrum of the case parts. You can have multiple. You can have multiple. You could also have multiple ones. All right. And the reason why we think, okay, so, all right, so. Uh, I just wanted to point out that there is some resonance with earlier work by uh, Larkai, uh, you know, where they have been looking at noise in different uh, models, etc., etc., and they find that. But uh, so let me just tell you what it is that I'm finally saying clearly. The same message is that memoryless nonlinear. See, memoryless says that the process itself does not add memory, that is, it doesn't add long time correlations. So memoryless nonlinear response of input Gaussian noise, Brownian noise, any noise, with a power spectrum of 1 over f to the power alpha, this will produce noisy output that has power spectrum of 1 over f to the alpha type, alpha prime type at low p. The non-trivial value of the spectral exponent alpha prime depends on alpha, but it also depends on the characteristics of this transfer function. Right? This exponent b in my particular examples, but it could be anything more than that. And this may be the underlying cause for why we see so many instances of 1 over f noise, that the original processes are either Gaussian or Brownian, but the process of transferring gives you an exponent that lies somewhere between 1 and 2. Thank you. <laughs>